Hi, it's Greg Harrell here, and I hope you're in the mood for a good rant, uh, because the topic tonight is throwing off the yoke of our digital oppressors in Mountain View, Google. Uh, or maybe that's a little bit hyperbolic. I'm really just going to be talking about getting your email off of Gmail servers onto a different provider servers. Um, in this case, Fastmail. Um, now, what you can see on the screen is, is the Fastmail web client. Um, I'm not going to take you on a tour of this, mostly because I don't want to take you on a tour of my email. Uh, but what you can see on the screen is um, a folder with some impersonal messages from, from a mailing list. Um, and if you were to explore this interface, you'd see it is actually very much like the Gmail interface. I mean, how many ways can you actually make a webmail interface? I mean, it's a list of messages and stuff. Um, it's got keyboard shortcuts like uh, Gmail has. You can organize your mail into folders. You can use labels like Gmail does, which means a, a mail can te technically be labeled with more than one thing and appear to be in more than one place at a time. Um, the way I've got this set up is just to use traditional folders. Um, but other than that, the feature set is comparable to Gmail. So you've got filters um, and you've got the ability to uh, have multiple sending identities and, and, and so on and so forth. Basically, feature parity, if, if not potentially maybe a little bit better because the filtering is uh, a little bit more powerful if you want to get down into the, the sieve filtering language. But I don't want to talk too much about Fastmail itself. Uh, what I want to do is talk about not so much why I chose Fastmail as why I wanted to leave Gmail. Uh, because, you know, we're talking about going from a free service to a service that you have to pay money for. Um, and I've just told you that the feature set is basically on par. So why would you start paying for something that was previously free uh, if it's not going to give you any other tangible benefits in terms of features? Well, let me tell you. Uh, it's because I've been worried for a long time about Google monopolizing or being a gatekeeper really to my entire digital life uh, because it has so many services uh, that are orchestrated under this umbrella of a single Google account. You can imagine if you get locked out of your Google account, you're suddenly locked out of a large part of your digital life. Um, and that might sound melodramatic and you might think I sound like Richard Stallman, but uh, the truth is over the last few years, there've been some alarming stories in the media of people who've had Gmail accounts for like a decade or more getting locked out and unable to get back in because by virtue of the fact that Gmail has a billion plus users, probably on the order of 3 billion, I'm guessing at this stage, you're never going to speak to a human if you have some problem. Um, that's probably true even if you pay for G Suite, which has been renamed to Google Workspaces, I think, maybe. It doesn't matter. Unless you're paying them a fuck ton of money, you can't talk to anyone at Google. And in fact, there was a high profile story circulating on Hacker News or Twitter maybe a month ago about a Google employee whose partner lost access to his account for no discernible reason. The Google employee was incapable of getting his partner's account reinstated because basically once your account gets deactivated due to some machine learning abuse detection system that that may or may not be reliable, you basically fucked. Um, so the first time I heard about this, I don't know how many years ago it was, I think it was either a journalist or somebody who was friends with a journalist and was thus able to bring the story to light. Um, this was one of those people who lost access to their Google account. Um, I believe the story was something like they had been watching a live stream on YouTube. There was this kind of innocuous game going on, which was like, let's spam the comments with a word and see how fast we can make it scroll or something like that. Something stupid in a name. And of course, the automated abuse detection system kicks in and wound up deactivating a bunch of accounts. This person got locked out of their account. You can imagine what that might mean. It might mean loss of access to photos of your children. It might mean inability to log into your bank website because you can't receive the two-factor auth token in your Gmail. Um, it might mean losing access to like financial spreadsheets in, in Google Docs or any of a number of other things. I mean, in my case, like I've got a YouTube channel with a number of followers. If I got locked out of my YouTube account, there's no way I'd be able to ever talk to them again. I'd have to start from scratch. Um, so multiply that by like the 200 possible services that you might have linked to your Google account. Um, and I've, uh, it gets scary, right? Um, and it's not just journalists who occasionally surface these stories. Um, there was another one uh, only, I think a couple of weeks ago or maybe less on Hacker News. Um, I've also heard directly from people I know. Um, one of my colleagues, his wife got locked out and never got back in again. And every time I hear one of these stories, it basically scares the crap out of me uh, because 
I don't want uh, my entire digital life to collapse because of some arbitrary machine-driven decision that I can't appeal. Um, and I can't even pay to make the problem go away. So that's why I would switch uh, from Gmail to Fastmail, even if it means going from free to paid. Um, what are a couple of other reasons why people sometimes say they might move from Gmail? Uh, one that occurs to me is uh, that the old argument of like, if you're, if you're not paying for something, then you are the product. So the argument is that Google indexes your email in order to know more about you and therefore target you better with ads and uh, charge more money to advertisers uh, in order to reach you. Um, that one has never really concerned me, if nothing else, because I know that I'm just tracked and scrutinized from so many angles and my data is just so promiscuously shared with so many companies that genie is out of the bottle and I have no way of putting it back in. I'm basically screwed. So it's like, I, I just don't care that Google knows even more about me than they already did. I mean, they were basically omniscient in the first place, right? Um, and the truth is, I actually don't use email that much, um, at least not willingly. Like I, I use email because a company chooses to communicate with me via email to like send me the bill for my electricity, uh, for example, um, not because I email is my favorite way of exchanging information. I mean, it probably was 30 years ago back when email was good, you know, but <laughs> now it's uh, not that great. But I'm getting sidetracked. Um, so that one reason that people complain about Gmail is the uh, don't, don't be a product angle. Another angle is it's in the US and Google is probably collaborating with the NSA and other branches of the US government to grant secret clandestine access to the intelligence agencies. Once again, I don't really care because emails are fundamentally a secure medium and whether or not the US government has access to my emails at rest on Google servers, they certainly have access to everything I've ever received or sent as it went over the wires, you know, under the, the trench, the cable work in the, at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, right, where they've jacked in there. Shit like that, which sounded like crazy conspiracy theories, you know, 10 years ago. And of course, with the Snowden revelations has been revealed to be only the, the just scratching the surface of what the intelligence agencies do uh, in order to monitor literally everything that goes online that they are able to get access to. Um, so that's another thing that, once again, I don't care about. Like, I treat email as an insecure medium, and uh, I'm not worried about anyone reading any of it uh, it's when it comes to government agencies, because I, I just assume they already have, right? That's also why, for example, I chose Fastmail instead of a company like ProtonMail, which um, is based in Switzerland. Apparently, their servers are, like, buried under, like, 200 meters of mountainous rock. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, and they encrypt all their email at rest, um, basically for the same reason. Like, I couldn't really care less about their security uh, because, you, you, I mean, you don't have end-to-end -end encryption in email, so I'm just not even going to worry about it. Unless you're doing the PGP thing, which I've, I've, in like 30 years of mail usage, I think I've done it once because, like, none of the people I communicate with have PGP keys. Hmm. Um, so that's the motivation for wanting to move uh, from Gmail. Um, the reason why I chose Fastmail is because, like I said, I don't care about false claims of security that aren't end-to-end. -end. Um, I just want something that works really well. And Fastmail does work really well. I was able to, um, as you can see here, I've got around eight gigs of email on this particular account, but I was able to move four accounts um, and importing or migrating email from Google to the Fastmail servers took about 10 minutes for each of those accounts. Um, I was able to migrate calendars, contacts, rules, uh, pretty easily exported from Gmail and imported into Fastmail. So all of that stuff was fine. Okay, so I just want to take a quick look at the uh, fastmail.com website so that um, you could come, go here if you wanted to learn more. But I, I just want to jog my memory about what the features are in case there's anything that we should talk about. And we've already seen that there's the webmail client, which is great. Um, it's also, they've also got a couple of uh, native apps uh, for iOS and Android. Um, I've, I've only tried the iOS one, but it's really good. Uh, it looks just like the web client in terms of UX and UI and visuals. So in other words, it's not the prettiest thing out there, but it's incredibly functional and it's incredibly fast. And it's quite seamless to move back and forth between them because they really do feel like the same app. Um, it is native, despite the fact that it looks like, a, looks like the web app. Um, as they note here, you can, of course, plug in pretty much any uh, mail client that you might want. Um, I personally don't use mail clients anymore. Um, I used to use uh, Mutt, 
And I stopped using it because it was like Vim, but not enough like Vim to really be Vim. And that kind of annoyed me. Um, and so you could use MUT or NeoMUT to talk to FastMail servers. Uh, but one reason why you might not want to is that in addition to supporting IMAP as a communication protocol, um, they also support a protocol called JMAP, which they invented, which stands for JSON Meta Application Protocol. Um, and despite the name sounding kind of like IMAP, this is actually much more than IMAP and it's much more general than that. It's really just a communication protocol for apps that happens to use JSON as a transport. Um, and the reason why JMAP is exciting is because it is way faster than IMAP, uh, partly because uh, the communication protocol is less chatty. So whereas with IMAP, you might have to talk to a server and say, hey, tell me what's happening, what messages are there? And then I'll say, well, these are the messages. And then you have to say, okay, well, tell me, the, tell me, tell me what's in this message and tell me what's in this message. Um, you can instead just send a single request to like, you know, show me the contents of this folder and everything that's inside it and get everything back in one response. Um, so that is noticeably quicker when you're using the, the web client and the iOS client. Um, I've done some very aggressive operations that in Gmail would have timed out or failed silently, like, you know, trashing, you know, 10,000 messages at once. Those are the kind of things that you end up having to wait a long time for in Gmail. And sometimes they don't work. Like you, it'll say it does it. And then you go back to the folder, you know, a few minutes later and half the messages are still there. Um, so no matter how much stress testing I've applied uh, to FastMail so far, I've never had that kind of problem with it. And I think uh, JMAP may well be one of the important reasons for that. So going back to my other tab here, um, you can see a little screenshot of what the mobile app looks like um, and nothing really interesting to talk about there. That's what the calendar looks like, totally adequate. Um, as you can see here, you can manage multiple sending identities, which for me is interesting because I have uh, multiple domains hooked up to my account. Um, and so I have the ability to, in addition to send, do things like catch all addresses and aliases um, and group aliases, I can send email from the aliases um, in, some, in some ways even more powerful than I, powerfully than I could with uh, Gmail. Uh, and uh, I can set reasonable defaults. So I have the flexibility there when I need it, but most of the time it just is the right thing. So I'm very happy in terms of the typical workflows that I do um, related to you know, sending and receiving email and managing multiple accounts and identities and aliases. Um, and then I don't think there's anything else worth remarking on there, but let's look at pricing. Because as I said at the beginning, you're going from something that might, might be free uh, to something that is not free. Um, in my case, uh, I have always used a custom domain. And a long time ago, G Suite, before it became Google Workspaces, and before it was even G Suite, it was called Google Apps for Business. Um, and back in the days, a long time ago, you could actually start a small Google Apps for Business account. And as long as you only had a small number of users, um, it was free. So I got grandfathered into that plan even when they started charging, I think it's it's now $6 a month uh, per user. So I was grandfathered into that and I got it for free. So you can see the the, the parity here of the, uh, the $5 per user per month plan is roughly um, on par with the $6 per user per month plan that you pay at Google. I don't know about volume discounts at Google because I never paid, uh, but uh, certainly with FastMail, if you pay a year in advance, then you get a bit of a discount. It ends up being $50 a year instead of 60, something like that. Um, other than that, the feature, as I said, the feature set is uh, basically on par and in some ways better than Google. Um, and the reliability, I think partly because of JMAP is, is just totally on. Um, the other thing I would add is the, uh, the management interface seems pretty solid. It's, it's simple um, and everything is right there, easy to find. Whereas when I go into Google's management interface, it's this labyrinthine kind of hideous Frankenstein where you can see that it's been cobbled together from the work of like dozens and dozens of different teams. And they're all innovating, trying to optimize their own metrics and changing stuff all the time. And then, and the thing just is, it's just like mutating like a I don't know what the analogy is, but basically I could never find shit in Google Mail, um, G Suite admin interface. I mean, I just don't have that problem at all with uh, FastMail. So at this point, it's still pretty early days in my experience with FastMail. Um, and while I've been happy with it so far, like things could change. Uh, but so far, so good. Um, and... I feel good about the fact that I've managed to move a significant part of my digital footprint away from Google. Um, and 
It is true that I still have a Google account with my old email address, even though my MX records are now pointing to the new Fastmail hosting. So what that means is I can still log into my Google account. And for example, my Google bookmarks are, uh, I'm signing into Chrome with my, my, my personal email address that was formerly hosted on G Suite. So there is a possibility that at some point Google will detect that my account is like in this zombie state where like I'm, I'm logging in with an email address that's supposedly a G Suite address, but it's not actually a G Suite address anymore. And I might get locked out. So I'm doing the whole Google takeout thing, uh, which is one of the great things that I think has come out of the European data protection laws. They basically force big companies to give you access to your data. And so you can go to Google and do this thing called Google takeout, download a copy of your data periodically, so that even if you do get locked out, you'll at least have access to the raw bits. Um, in my case, I'd be sad to lose some spreadsheets and documents that I have uh, and bookmarks. But other than that, it, well, losing access to my YouTube account would kind of suck. I'd have to start again. Uh, but um, other than that, uh, I feel pretty good now about where I am with respect to Google. Uh, I'm not going to switch to Firefox though because the scrolling is jank and I cannot. Once you've observed the difference between the buttery smoothness of Chrome and the the scratchy jankiness of Firefox, I just can't unsee it, so sorry. Um, so I think that's all I've got to say about email. Thanks for listening to the rant and I'll see you next time. The thing about living in the middle of the city is like sirens all the time. It's like, what the fuck, am I living in goddamn Detroit or Portland? Where are they going? Like, what's the hurry? I bet you there's like, they're, they're speeding to the fucking donut shop or something.